here. The San Francisco Shock versus the Toronto Defiant. Uh, and this is an interesting match as well. I'm hoping it's going to be a bit more competitive than the matches we've had so far this week. Because honestly, Josh, yeah. it's been a bit of a, bit of a snooze <laughs> fest, honestly. I'm there, not going to lie. There have been... There have been some obliterations happening so far this week in the June Joust. People yeah. getting slapped left, right, and center. I think that this game <laughs> might go the same way, honestly, Brian. I'm not going to wow. lie. The San Francisco Shock, I'm expecting them to come out here into the June Joust, their first game of this next stage, with fire lit underneath them. Yeah. Now, that's no guarantee. I'm not, I'm not saying it's absolutely going to occur. I'm just expecting it based on the years of historic... Um, storylines that have repeated themselves with this dominant core roster where every time they take a loss they come back even more fiery with even more punch it just feels like the right time for shock to do it yeah i mean we, this is what custer was talking about as well in the pre-show he's talking about how uh, this happens often where the shock will stumble a little bit and then they go on to have a dominant form um yeah. we've seen it in the past but that is really, I think, the, the overarching question for me coming into this is how good are the Shock really going to be looking against the Toronto Defiant that's also having a, a couple of issues at the moment as well. And they've got some short-term contracts being happening as well. Here's the Shock starters, though, and this is the roster they're going to be rolling out with. It has been almost a month since this team has last played, Josh. The Shock, I think, it's last crazy. played on the 2nd of May against the Dallas Fuel. So I'm not sure what we're going to be seeing from the Shock here. It's almost impossible to be able to tell. Now, the one thing I would expect is Smurf to be playing way more than Super. Super played a lot in the previous meta because Reinhardt and Winston had to interchange. In this meta, in the June Joust meta, it's much more about that Orissa being able to flex from the Winston. So Smurf seems like your man. My questions come in as to how the DPS factor in and the Ana play as well. Normally when the San Francisco Shock run Ana, it's not Violet in, it's Twilight. And yeah. last time in the main melee, we saw Violet transition into DPS. Are we going to see more of that, Bren? Is Violet going to be playing Echo? Surely not, right? Uh, yeah, I'm not too sure. The musical chairs that we've been seeing from a lot of these teams, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, I, I, I think that it's worked out sometimes because they've been one-sided affairs, but I think consistent roles is generally the key to victory for a lot of these teams. The Toronto Defiant, as I've said previously, got some short-term contracts. Aspire is going to be playing here for the Defiant, but other than that, the usual suspect's going to be playing in this match here today. Yeah, he's uh, both him and Lastro are mysterious individuals replaced by yeah. the Toronto Defiant logo here. But we'll tell you a bit more about Aspire as we move throughout this match as well. A guy who's come in from Contenders, a hit scan player who's going to be doing his best here and has his chance in the limelight to really show what he's capable of on this short term contract with the Toronto Defiant. Uh, as for the rest of the team, this is a, a team that's really trying to find their style. They've been playing a lot of Winston kind of compositions with Nice uh, doing a lot of big flanking maneuvers, whether that be on the Soldier 76 or on the Echo as well. And they've had some success and they still have a very good match record. So this is going to be an interesting litmus test for the San Francisco Shock. If they dismiss the Toronto Defiant completely and, and whack them 3-0, well, all right then, we can start feeling very confident about San Francisco. If they start having close games against a Toronto Defiant team that's already having a couple of issues and has a substitute player in, well, now we start to have some concerns about the Shock's dominance throughout the June Joust. This yeah. is a really cool game to get a first indicator of Shock's power in June. Yeah, and uh, you may have noticed as well, a lot of the Shock players were just kind of getting settled into their PCs. I don't think they were expecting uh, to be playing so soon, obviously, off the back of another, like, what was that, one-hour match coming <laughs> yeah. into this one? So, We've been uh, yeah, speed running this week. Yeah, we are waiting for them to, to basically get into their seats and get ready. It's, it's a Shock who are waiting on. Oasis will be the first map um, that we're heading into. So, yeah, typically we've been seeing a lot of these Winston Rush compositions on Oasis as well, um, which the Shock you'd think would be quite good at. Uh, and you can kind of assume as well, going to be seeing a lot of that mixture with Smurf uh, being played in the active roster here. And I want to just highlight another narrative from the main melee here. The San Francisco Shock, in their previous years, what has carried them to these dominant victories in 2019 and 2020, their championship wins, has been their excellence on control maps. They were essentially impossible to beat when it came to control. Striker would frequently be playing Tracer. They'd have these amazing coordinated team fights, and control became their map type. Instead, in this season, they actually have a losing record on control. They're three and four 
Now, that could all shift because we've got hero pools in and people are playing different compositions. But I think that's a really interesting narrative to follow for Shock throughout the season. Because Control is an insanely important game type. It happens frequently. You can't draw on it. One team must win. One team must lose. It's used to open series. It's used to decide series. And if the Shock slip with their dominance on this map type, it could spell the end of the three-peat dreams. Yeah, it's a really good, uh, really good, I think, storyline to kind of lead in here. Um, as you can see, we do have our hero pool rotation. So, like we've been saying previously, obviously the Reinhardt, the Tracer, the Sombra, and the Zen unavailable. The Divine have only taken one map off of the Shock in their history. Oasis in week 14 of 2020. Well, we're Not here bad. on Oasis. Might see history repeat itself. Might not. We're about to find out. The gates have opened up, and it's looking like we're going to be seeing some differing compositions from either side. The San Francisco Shock going to be going out with that Reaper Echo Rush composition. We've seen a lot of teams be running this one. The Defiant trying their luck here with the double shield. Mm. Yeah, this stage is still pretty good for the Orisa Sigma. Smoke's going to be looking for an engage. Huge amounts of poke damage as he goes in, and they're going to have to back off just for a moment. Yeah, just for a moment, going to be biding their time, but now the cooldowns are back up. The leap comes through, trying to separate Michelle into the side room. The grass gets used early. Not going to get that kill, though, what they were looking for. Striker, Ray forming out, but Smurf beams down, and the Defiant. Oh, they've got all the damage they need to clean up the rest of these players. And the opening of this point going to be going their way. Nice and easily here, and a pretty strong and powerful position to be in, I think, when you're running this double shield composition now. Yeah, that first team fight is really important. San Francisco Shock, uh, their team, their composition rather, if they took control, would be able to play really aggressive. For Toronto, it's just that Shock now have to go through more and more choke points as they're recontesting. You saw how much poke damage Smurf took as he was trying to approach. It is so difficult to play Winston into these. Your your pushes are so telegraphed. Oh, oh and Violet! He gets his oh. core lessons cancelled. What a rock from Michelle! That is insane from Michelle. What a play. The one ultimate that the Shock needed to try and turn this fight is completely taken out of action. And now you can see they're just trying to hunt down the rest of these players. Striker had to return with the rest of his team. Nice. Trying to chase him down, but out of the Diva form. Back into Echo. And now we're going to see the fight continue. Trading blow for blow. Smurf will eventually fall in there. He's just trying to get that chip damage as he's trying to flank around the beam. Will it be enough? He does take out Lastro, but. The team fight has gone the way of the Toronto Defiant once more. Hello. We saw in that previous series with the Houston Outlaws, every time their win condition was the Moira Coalescence. To be able to cancel Violets there is devastating for the Shock. He builds up another half of one already because it is that quick to charge the ultimate up. But they're not going to have the tool again for this team fight. And Toronto are up to 80% already by the time the Shock get in. This is almost going to be last fight territory. The Shock are going to make a go of it here. The sound barrier has led in. Bob into the corner. Shock though way past that point. Now the coalescence to layer on top. Just trying to win out this team fight, but it's so hard to chunk through this rally armor. But that might just do it. A very intelligent duplicate there from Nero moving over to the Sigma. It's a lot of damage building up that quick gravitic flux and the team fight over just like that. So the shock not out of it just yet. Double support ultimates used and both DPS ultimates as well. Striker had to use Death Blossom, Nero duplicated. The Shock don't have that many more tools to be able to hold on here. My eyes are on Nice. We've seen so many flanks from him before, and he's again off on his own, just with a Brigitte armor pack to keep him sustained. But the Shock are going aggressive. aggressive. Yeah, it's super aggressive from the Shock. They recognize that they don't have any ults. They have oh, to try Stryker. and create some opportunities, but Striker goes down once more. I think that was... A shield bash into that one to try and lock him up long enough, and that's going to be the duplicate here. You can see nice. I don't know if the Lucia was his intended target, but the sound barrier is certainly going to be helping him regardless. And again, nice with the beam. Smurf goes down. Great tracking from him. FD God will follow suit. Coalescence comes out now from Violet trying to win out this team fight once more. South Destruct might get a kill, not quite. Enough shields and barriers in the way to try and block a lot of that damage from happening. And now the supercharger, Toronto, they're going to take and wrangle back control of this point, but the overtime will start to tick. The Shock are getting close to a sound barrier of their own. And Smurf dives incredibly deep as well, trying to pressure down Aspire, the new sub for the Toronto Defiant, who did such a good job of removing Striker in the previous. Speaking of Striker, he's towards the back as well, desperately trying to peel for Smurf with oh a bit of damage. Oh my goodness. But he just can't hold on. Yeah, the Sambaria just did not catch in time. Still, the Shock 
Look like they're winning out this team fight. Sado was probably one of the sole survivors here. Has to back off to the rest of his team. And that was looking so, so dangerous there for the Shock. Now Toronto, obviously they do have an opportunity to repush this now with the Rally. Possibly the High Noon as well, the Deadeye, to just try and clear a bit of space. But the Shock are coming close to those ults to start rotating. Another Coalescence almost online. Yeah, they're going to have that, and they're going to have a duplicate as well. Nero could turn this one around as long as Smurf doesn't get caught. This is looking pretty good for the Shock. And here it is, another Coalescence engagement. The Flashbang does connect. Oh, this Deadeye has to be absolutely massive, but Nero duplicating over to the Diva. The Defense Matrix was there, eats it all up. The South Destruct comes in, forces oh, the no. positioning back, Rosado gets picked off, the Ammatrix. It's a, almost a last ditch effort here as we're heading into almost the final fight. Aspire though, Ooh, what a timing! There you go, Flashbang fan, the hammer might be doing the business right now. Everything's coming up. Aspire as he's just trying to collect a couple of these kills, but Smurf trying to clutch it up with an old of his own. The Primal Rage does get two in the back lines, the fight continues here. Choi Hyobin just needs to try and stay alive, but he's been pressured so heavily. But look at this. The PL comes through from FD. God, Choi so close to building up this ultimate. One HP. He's finally got back into the mech, and the overtime still goes. Toronto not flipping this over just yet. They want to keep fighting this one. But the bodies are still remaining. The Shock are just keeping this one going, but eventually goes their way as they have to respect that supercharger that was Teleport. laid down. But now it fades to Death Blossom. So engage, trying to lead it into them. Defense Matrix will eat up a lot of that damage on the side of Toronto Defiant, but they've lost two players. They might be making it a couple more as the Coalescence is finally going to start hosing them all down, and that will mean the Shock just about snatching away that round from the Toronto Defiant. Well, if that one round is any indicator, we are in for a match. This might be our, uh, our first blockbuster in North America of the week. This was a really close round. The Shock were at a massive disadvantage. I think that Toronto Defiant was something like 82% to zero, and the Shock came back. The biggest difference maker being the fact that the Shock's ultimates get online so much more quickly. Violet's building up Coalescence every other team fight. Sometimes every, sometimes every team fight. And even though Striker's teleports into the backline on Reaper are getting red, he is still being able to sync up with the rest of the team quite nicely. This time, though, big compositional shift as both teams are essentially mirroring each other apart from the May and the Reaper swap. Toronto Defiant looking to maybe brawl a little more. Yeah, both teams going to be clashing soon enough. You can see the Shock are just kind of teasing the idea that they might be taking this high ground control. It's just Choi, actually. They're very split across the approach. Sado is so, so low onto the point, though. Oh, and he's been pressured out. And that's going to be that May Wall from Nero actually separating them away once more. And at this point, yeah, Toronto just cannot stand up against the onslaught of the Shock. An early capture for them. And this time the Shock with this double shield composition going to be holding in these more active positions, going to be spamming them out when Toronto try and, I guess, progress onto the point to try and get better positioning. Michelle's moved over to Sigma here, so double shield matched on both sides. A nice on the Doomfist. Gives him insta-kill opportunities, but Striker is still going to be able to do a lot of poke damage to stop him getting in. Again, Nice is a player that loves to go for flanks. If he's able to get looping in around them, Ooh, like you can see him looking for the timings. Yeah, punch on one of the players. That wall is going to be put up, and that actually stops the Ant Matrix from getting a bit of value for a, a short amount of time. But you can see Shock now just rotating back down to the point and trading the cooldown. So Choi used the grasp. Now the Deadeye from Striker leading in. They have oh, caught one wall. player, two players, and there you go. Nice accretion to lead into that one. Striker just needs to hit a couple more shots here, but three kills now for the Shock. Defiant, unable to really contest this one any more. Very good slow play from the Shock. The timing from the Deadeye was lovely as well. Nice did already, commi already committed cooldowns, so he was pretty much locked in, and the Toronto Defiant had moved through the choke, allowing Nero to get a really nice wall that blocked Sado off from retreating. And now Shock have access to so many ultimates. They're at such an enormous advantage in this round. Smurf ate a lot of damage and it's built up Violet to 55% of the next Amp Matrix. And look at this, leading in, the Hulk connects onto all of them. It forces a sound barrier so early on. Ults coming out from the Define as they try and turn this one, but again, just playing straight into the Blizzard. And now this Gravitic Flux that Choi is holding onto. I mean, there's not going to be a sound barrier on the other side of things. They might opt Good to try kill. and commit it though. Striker goes down and that's Aspire again, finding some of that value from these off-angle flanks. Still continuing to layer in the shots. Look at that damage is oh, being done. Rolls forward so to try close. and connect it, but that soundbar from FD God just about saving, and Violet has to play around this corner. The Ant Matrix is there. 
Gravitic Flux was used a little bit earlier there. I missed how much value that Choi really was able to get from it, but it matters not. The kill in the end connects. A saddle will fall. And the Ant Matrix finally lay it down, just preventing the Toronto Defiant from really pushing and preventing them from even touching. The Shock going to be walking away with map number one here. And it was looking a little bit dicey, a little bit sketchy there in that first initial round, but eventually battling back with a bit of that Shock dominance that we're used to, I think. Yeah, and if you consider the fact that Toronto were up 80% before Shock came back, Really, the second half of that map was not close in the slightest. It was Shock just getting online and being a little slow to warm up with the benefit of hindsight. Interesting, interesting first map there. For me, the bright spot for the Toronto Defiant was Aspire, their sub, who came oh, yeah. in in a rough scenario. He's playing against what some people could argue are the best team in the league. They're the defending champions at the very least. And he puts up an extremely uh, decent performance that he could be proud of. Well, we're going to be heading to a short break on the other side of things. Will the Shock be able to keep up this kind of form? Or will we see a bit of a closer affair? Maybe like that initial round from the Toronto Defiant. Don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. Even more Overwatch League action coming right up. The Overwatch League is brought to you by T-Mobile, America's largest and fastest 5G network. Set your sights on the competition with T-Mobile. The Overwatch League is brought to you by Coca-Cola, the official refreshment of the Overwatch League. And by IBM, the official cloud and AI partner of the Overwatch League.
let's take a look at our Indeed player resume, and we're actually going to be shining a spotlight on Aspire here. This is the guy who's coming in on the short-term contract here for the Toronto Defiant, and you can see his accomplishments. A lot of finalists, or at least a lot of high-place finishes when he's been playing on Dark Mode NA in the contender scene. And honestly, in that first map, Josh, uh, a pretty good performance, I think, against uh, potentially one of the best teams currently in North America. Uh, from the hitscan perspective, I mean, the guy feels like he really does belong here. Absolutely. Yeah, his performance was really high. He was able to get some nice shots to be able to trade with Striker, um, to be able to catch him when he was going for teleports. It was all good. But honestly, Bren, my focus is not particularly on Aspire for this map. It's on Glister. There, the community has been calling. People have been stapling <laughs> wanted, uh, not wanted posters, lost and found posters out to telephone poles all around the world. Where is Glister? Where was Glister? Who knows, but he's here now. He's getting fielded for Junkertown. Bren, I want to throw some stats at you, man. Just think about this from Glister's point of view. He hasn't been fielded since week one. His last game was their close loss to the Houston Outlaws. This guy came off an 11 match losing streak playing for the London Spitfire in 2020. He came, he joined the San Francisco Shock. He's like, all right, everything's coming up Glister this year plays two games, one he wins, one he loses, and then he's benched for seven weeks. I, yeah. I mean, it, it it really has been confusing, their lack of utilization of this player that we know is a very skilled talent. So I'm so hyped to see it. Yeah, especially when, <laughs> you know, Glister, I mean, he's most well known, I suppose, for his long range hit scan prowess. And, uh, the Shock were opting to use Violet in some of those positions, where they'd be having Violet play McCree, and absolutely, it was uh, it was getting kind of uh, kind of funny for a second. But uh, yeah, he's seeing some playtime here, uh, and he's teasing us a little bit with the Echo. I know it is something that's in his wheelhouse ever so slightly. Macy oh, come yeah. out to play. Um, yeah, he's he's an incredibly flexible player, Brandon. Even though a lot of what he was doing was that long range hit scan for the London Spitfire, he's been playing Genji before. He can he can play the Echo. He can play every projectile here when you want as well. He's a true true talent that if the Shock put time into developing, could become one of the elites of the game. I'm in, I'm anticipating seeing either some double sniper come out here with Glister playing Widow and Nero playing the Hanzo, or maybe Nero will continue playing Echo and Glister will just play the Widowmaker. Uh, there's a lot of different things that this DPS duo could run for San Francisco. That is such a cheeky angle. I didn't even realize that existed. You could shoot underneath that scrap metal. Okay. These contenders players, all they've got to do is find the weird little nerd spot. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing. Oh, there you go. Here's Glister on the Widowmaker. All eyes on this guy because we were wondering for the longest time, where was he, where was he? Well, this is his opportunity to try and showcase what he can do, but Oof. Aspire immediately going to be removing him from this fight. And, well, the Shock aren't running to Mercy. There's going to be no res on the field. So, going to be having to make do now with the 5v6 fight. And you can see that they're just playing around out of the line of sights. For the time being, Aspire goes for the jump shot again to try and spawn camp Glister. No one's really dealing with him here. He's getting some clean shots off. Shock backing off, just healing it back up, trying to build up those ultimates. Nero has got in really deep behind. This is the kind of play that we expect to see from Nice, but Nice himself picks off Glister. That gives long range superiority to Aspire, at least until Nero picks him. No one's really dealing with Nero, but at the same time, no one's dealing with Nice again on this flank off angle, and look at this. Sticky bombs into the try shots. He's got his team to support him as well. Nero is still alive, but not for much longer. And uh, yeah, the Define on the defense side. Going to be getting that hold just in time. And a large part of it off the back of Aspire. This guy just getting the opening pick off multiple times. As a defender Widowmaker, though, you have to play a little more defensive than the attacker. A Glister can die over and over again because he has short respawns. It doesn't really hurt. But as soon as Aspire dies and they don't have that Resurrect, they're in a 6v5 and they're probably losing checkpoint A. Now Matrix online here for the Shock. You've got to try and respect this one here. The final going to be going in with, a ra oh, with the Rally and the Am Matrix. Ooh, around. Nero trying to wrap all the way around. Yep, Nero's been pulled in. That's a Gravitic Flux as well to lead it in. The Shock are falling quite low into this fight here. If the Egot goes down, and again, you can see Aspire just pumping in that damage from afar. Michelle, though, trying to turn things around. Not quite turning it around when they're already winning the fight. It is just cleanup duty for them. 
And the, here's my problem with watching the Shock right now. They don't look like their old dominant selves. The selves where you were confident that they were going to win every stage final that they entered. Even if sometimes they weren't quite able to close it out. And here's one of my issues that I think uh, the audience will be able to follow as well. Is that as their main body of their team is pushing down main, Smurf on the payload, that kind of thing. Choyobin and FD got are trying to contest through this house that has the Mega Packet. And their timing just isn't quite correct. Here we go, though, Duplicate into the back, and this is a great position Ooh. for Nero to be in. This time, fantastic is position. He's already built up the Gravitic Flux. There we go, send it into the back line. Supercharger goes down. Michelle so low here. Sato's just trying to basically stall this one out, but the Fortify is going to fade, and he's going to pay for it with his life in the end. So, a bit of coordination comes out from the shock that was there. Much just, yeah, you've talked about it before about this uh, this concept of this killer instinct that some of the top teams possess and how the Shock have kind of been missing it for a short amount of time. Those are the kind of opportunities you want to see that the Shock are capitalizing on, setting up their own players for success with Nero coming in at the flank there, just putting out way too much damage. Definitely. For me, the top teams, especially the Shock, it's all about how they work their timings and how they uh, have pressure at the right times. Everybody needs to be saving their cooldowns and waiting until they're in the best positions and then engaging all at once. That's the kind of stuff, the raw fundamentals that Shock does better than everyone else, at least when they're on top. And that was a great example of it there in that team fight. You can see the Widowmaker ultimates there uh, are going to be traded out at the same time, so both teams don't really want to push into this. Um, this obviously, they have complete vision and information as to where they might be. Oh my, Glister just, I guess he just mistimed the ultimate, or miscounted it perhaps, because the Spire still had a little bit of vision onto him and collects the headshot early, and it seems like, really, Aspire is the one who is making this incredibly difficult for the Shock here. Just trying to push Definitely. into him every single time, and the headshots that he's hitting, the guy is just uncontested. He really is. He feels like he's under no pressure. The defensive Widowmaker is going to have advantages in terms of the positioning that they can take, uh, but they have to play a little more safely, because if they die, then it's a massive disadvantage for their team. Still though, Aspire on the sight lines that he's been holding has been hitting shots over and over again. Even against three shields, Smurf, Choyobin, and FD Gods, he's still finding headshots and damage that stop the Shock taking forward positioning. And against the Shock, against this comp in particular, it's all about stopping them taking that forward positioning. You've got to stop them taking the high ground that they're looking to loop around right now. I mean, Aspire's already built up another ultimate. <laughs> this would this be devastating. Be... I mean, look at Glister. He's at 21% because he just can't get in position. That's the difference in damage. Accretion sent up to the high ground. Glister's hunting for those opportunities. And it is difficult because you're offered very, very small windows to try and find the damage. And Troy Brutalized. will be the one who goes down here. That's the Gravitic Flux. Nice also going to be duplicating over here onto the Sigma. And the Spire is just, again, just holding down these angles. It's very difficult for them to try and push into. This time, no, okay. Glister does catch him. The thing is, it's at the end of a team fight. Violet's already fallen, so unless they want to push without their Batiste, Aspire will be given enough time to return to the fight. Not the perfectly timed pick, but I guess Glister will take him where he can. He certainly will. That halt nearly this. caught nice. That was yeah, so nice. close. Playing around that car just to try and contest it. The Supercharger from Sada will... Again, push them off because they need to respect this one, but it's going to be a later one now from Smurf. Right around the corner, he's going to be leading his team in off the back of this one. Nice is searching for a flank and he's found it onto Glister. He goes down. Aspire also collecting the headshot onto Nero. That's the DPS down for the shock. And this could be curtains for them. The rally will keep them going for a short time, but they don't have the damage necessary to try and break through this. 11 seconds remaining. And their combat is far too slow to get into the action and into the fight. The Defiant holding strong here. Holt's not going to connect. Is anybody going to be able to touch the payload? Not going to be the case. I hate to say it, Brett, but that is a bit of a DPS diff. The nice being able to flank into positions where he can put constant pressure. And then also Aspire hitting every shot whenever there's a tiny, tiny window offered up to him. Aspire's been playing phenomenally in these first two maps. Remember that this guy's just come fresh out of contenders in a team that he has had no scrim time with on a short-term yep. contract filling in for players who are having health problems right now. That is phenomenal. That is an unbelievable situation to then perform some of your best Overwatch. I, I've got to be honest, I haven't been keeping my pulse on the Tier 2 scene at the same time as Overwatch League is going on, but I'm going to start keeping track of this guy now. 
he's come in immediately and started clapping some of the best players that we have in the league. And it's, uh, yeah, it's taking advantage of those opportunities that, that come before you is, uh, is really quite key, I think, for a lot of these players uh, in a tier two scene because uh, there's been a tendency in the past, absolutely, I think, in the Overwatch League for, uh, I guess, um, teams to not really look too deep into the, uh, the pool of talent that's available in, in tier two. Um, so for Aspire to come up like this in this fashion, obviously filling in on the short-term contract and to just be popping off is really quite promising for them. And he set up the Toronto Defiant with an incredible win condition here. Now, the question is now, <laughs> are they going to be able to do it on attack? Because like we've been trying to sell, I guess, the story of this has been that, you know, the defending Widowmaker, it's a lot easier for them. They can play all these weird angles. And the Aspire echo. now has to do it on attack. Yeah. I think that applies also to what Neist was trying to do, sneaking into hidden locations to be able to burst out onto Glister. Let's take a look at this Widow Duel. All right, Glister just spotting the head there of Nice for one moment, not able to capitalize on that opportunity. And the shock, they're all positioned inside this house. A different, a very different way of approaching this defense. It isolates Glister and Troyogan a little more. Yeah, you can see that Venom Mine just uh, it's going to get triggered in the end, but Glister tries to go for the jump shot and Aspire takes him out, removes the head, and yeah, you're going to be missing a decent amount of damage. And look at how aggressive, how wide of an angle Aspire can take now. He knows there's no threat of it. Shocker playing all indoors here, and he's got free yep. reign of the battlefield. He does. Now, this doesn't really hurt the shock that much because they're all just inside this house, but they can't get out. They're getting ambushed. They're getting shot from all different directions. And that is a serious problem. They're going to get picked to pieces unless someone could do it with Violet and Matrix. Oh, Alt's being committed here. Smurf just trying to hold on, just trying to play around the shield, but that is far too much damage to overcome. The Toronto Defiant making it look easy. And again, the story of this match so far, of this map, has been Aspire just really opening things up for the Toronto Defiant to sail it in. Let's take a look at this replay as well. This is why we were saying that defending Widowmakers, they have to play more defensively. This is unreal, actually. Oh, what that a is shot to hit. Superb timing. Glister wasn't really going for a jump shot, he was just trying to reposition. And Aspire times it perfectly and then hits hit while he's going in midair, and his opponent is flying in midair as well. Yeah, from almost maximum range, really, as well. Like, Junkertown is one of the widest and biggest maps that we've got in, in Overwatch. Uh, really, really impressive stuff. And now four and a half minutes, essentially, is what the Defiant will be working with here. So they're just trying to push this one in, and they don't have to push it in far. The Shock, they're going to have to try and stop them right here, right now. The Matrix comes down just underneath the bridge, so I think that's out of line aside from the Shock here. Supercharger. Laid down. Nice actually moving over to the Sigma. You can see him just duplicated up off onto the side there, just pumping in that damage. The halt into that accretion almost was enough to bring down Nero, but he got into the ice block in time. And this time the Defiant want to be pushing in with their own supercharger. It's met in the end as Violet will lay down one of those ultimates. The Amp Matrix comes through. And Glister has finally found one of those kills. It took a while, but he has found a pick. Aspire is still looking for that pick. It in order to return. If Glister falls, it's still pretty devastating for the Shock. And both teams were able to outlast the Supercharger by countering it with that Amp Matrix. So just enormous amounts of damage on both sides and neither team really wants to peek. This has certainly slowed things down. Ults come through. Gravitic Flux actually only connects onto Troy there. And you can see Nero with a very deep Blizzard. There's not going to be any follow-up for that. Yeah, uh, I mean, they just, they just kited out of the line of sight and it's ineffective. It buys them a bit of time though. Now the rally is just about fading here for Anson J, but the armor doesn't, so they're going to be trying to move in now with this extra, extra health. Aspire is finding it difficult to get the angles, I think. When you're trying to push checkpoint B of Junker Town, yeah. it doesn't really suit the Widowmaker playstyle that much, so you're definitely seeing his impact being mitigated ever so slightly. So the Shock not doing too poorly. No, but one single mistake and the chances of winning in, in this map will be ripped from their hands. One good flank from Aspire, one big headshot, and it's all gone. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Violet was just absolutely playing with death there. Just had no idea the shots were coming in. Eventually he's going to be going down, and now That's all eyes on Glister to try and do something here. So many players at the San Francisco Shock have fallen. 
They have to try and make some magic happen. You can see Nero's just trying to take a couple of risks. The ice block round in the corner. Very low. Immortality field. Sato going down there almost, but it is Choi who ends up trading with his life. And now just the onslaught that's happening here from the Defiance. And Matrix from the side. Is anybody going to be able to follow this one up? It doesn't look like it's going to be doable. Blizzard just into the back line, but the Fortify on Sato, which means he can waddle his way out of that one. Only a couple of players left. Nero out of the ice block form, and that is going to be the payload sailed right into the finish line. For the Defiant, taking away map number two here against the San Francisco Shock. What Smiles all a around. performance. Yeah. yeah, fantastic performance there, especially from Aspire. But, I mean, just for another moment, man. This guy has come in fresh from contenders, filling in, emergency substitute, almost no scrim time, and performs like this. He's having phenomenal impact, getting kills right when his team needs them, a huge amount of damage to stop the San Francisco Shock from approaching on when they were attacking. And the whole team as well of Toronto opting into these Orisa comps has made them look a lot more cohesive. They understand how to play this and they're not getting bullied in the same way that they were when they were playing Winston. Well, our wish has been granted. We've definitely got a series on our hands here as the Toronto Defiant are showcasing exactly what they are capable of. Let's find out on the other side of the break if they can take it just that little bit further forward and make the shock sweat just that little bit more. We'll see you in a minute. The Overwatch League is brought to you by T-Mobile, America's largest and fastest 5G network. Set your sights on the competition with T-Mobile. And by Xfinity, the preferred internet provider of the Overwatch League. The Overwatch League is brought to you by Pringles. Stay in the game. And by NetApp, 
the official data management partner of the Overwatch League. A new tournament means a new bracket is unlocked. So the first week of the June Joust definitely busted some brackets, but are you set to redeem yourself this weekend? Go to pick'em.overwatchleague.com to submit your picks for this week's matches. Uh, yeah, don't forget, like Josh, I know he's forgotten this week. I just know for a fact. Um, I, I don't think I did, actually. You know what? You I didn't. can't remember whether I forgot. So that doesn't bode well, does it? <laughs> My life is in pieces. <laughs> uh, let's take a look at the power rankings of IBM Watson uh, for the damage dealers leading into the week. And as you can see, Nero and Striker and Nice all sitting here, all members that are participating in this match right here. Interesting as well, though, that uh, Nero and Striker were ranked relatively highly without having played in the June Joust as well. So it is interesting. This is definitely it? Yeah. still something that could fluctuate much more because they only have those four, or I guess five, points of data under their belt with the matches that have been played so far. Uh, and that is the DPS duo that's going to be run here for the San Francisco Shock. Striker comes back in for Glister. So Glister, he's fielded in the week one games, comes back in for a single map where he gets boomed by a substitute player coming out straight from contenders on a short term contract, and he goes straight back to the bench. Uh, yeah. We will continue to give you updates on the Glister story as things progress here in the June Joust. It is a very weird scenario uh, uh, in terms of how yeah. they're rotating people. Here's our map leaderboard, uh, presented by Xfinity. As you can see, the Shock are the fifth fastest time versus the Valiant. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's that's one there for the history books. I mean, you're not going to be seeing that anytime soon, I don't think. Or those two teams probably playing against each other. Um, but I just want to touch on this this point as well, because I already I can already feel the wave of narratives coming off the back of this one. You know, Glister comes in, kind of gets dominated by you know Aspire coming in. Um, but Widowmaker, very confidence-based. I'm so, uh, This is coming straight from the heart, by the way, uh, Josh. Very confidence-based. Um, if you're not feeling it for whatever reason, then you can get into your head very easily when it comes to uh, your individual performance. I feel like in some way, someone needs to grab Blister by the shoulders and just shake him and say, you know, you are a good player. You've proven that you're a good player. To get him back into that form of perfor uh, former form, um, but yeah, yeah, we'll see another day. We'll see how he uh, how he gets utilized in the future, I suppose. Yeah, it's very difficult for a player to jump in after, what, seven weeks on the bench and then just come in and play their best uh, Overwatch immediately. So that that is a tough scenario to be in. But nevertheless, we're back with Nero and Striker. And what I'm looking at in this map in particular is that Toronto Defiant look like they're going to be running a Winston composition. But from what we saw on Junkertown, they look really coordinated on Orisa, and that means that I am so glad we see Sado moving over to that pick. This composition, I think, could revitalize Toronto Defiant's chances in the June Joust. I love this comp, or, or you know, the Michelle moving to Diva side of it as well. All of these are possible, and with Aspire looking like such a dangerous hit scan player as well, Toronto have some serious chances at getting ahead in the series. Certainly do. I mean, look at the uh, the overall season standings. I mean, Toronto currently are four and two. They are honestly having a pretty good time of it. They're overall. Doing very well. Yeah, doing very well. A win against the Shock here would be phenomenal for them. That's what they're looking to try and take again. Nice on his off angles. This is something that he was doing all the so time. Much that is a ridiculous amount of damage, and it forces the immortality field out. It's a major cooldown now. Going to be missing, Even more. and the Shock they have to use the sand matrix to try and survive it. Toronto Defiant are just going to kite this backwards, but if this... I mean, they're playing the point here, Josh. They're almost getting a second tick for free, it seems like. They've no one's going to contest. They have to try and win this fight into the choke point, but now they're going to be sent straight up into the air with a Scravitic Flux. And Third tick is for anyone going to contest? Is anyone going to touch? What is happening? Striker is there in the final moments with FD God, but everyone else has died. I mean, the San Francisco Shock are playing, actually, Brennan, in a very similar way to the way that they played the first point Junkertown. Really bunched up inside a building, trying to use the cover naturally that uh, walls and roofs provide. And instead, Toronto Defiant spread out around the map. They get Aspire in a good position, Nice goes on a flank, and they put in huge damage from off angles. The Shock feel like they just have a pretty bad read on how to play this comp right now. I need to see more from them. Yeah, this is not what I was sold by Custer on the Scrimbuck Exchange. He sold me a very good, very good shock product. He said they're not going to be performing like they did earlier. We've seen this one before. Well, big blizzard. Yeah, huge blizzard, actually. He's going to be catching a ton of players up. Nice, almost 
getting smurfed down. In fact, it will be a spy who connects it in the end, but it matters not. On the defense side, the shock have the advantage, and they're going to get that res on to smurf as well. That's the value gained by the May. Now, outside of that, I would say that, I mean, outside of the Blizzard itself, I haven't seen that much value be generated by Nero. We saw some moments when they were playing on control where it was quite nice, but on these wider maps like Junkertown or here on Hanamura, at least on point A, it felt kind of useless because Aspire and Nice were able to get onto off angles and put pressure down from long range. Yeah. Now that we hit to Hanamura point B though, Nero will be in much better positions well, to do this. His main walls will be able to find huge value. What I will say though is what I've noticed, oh, Aspire actually gets taken out there on the flank. Damage boosted up, Striker is able to get that one. Reses? What, what I, <laughs> any nope. reses? Are, any reses? Uh, really seeing it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, what I have noticed though is that you know, we've seen this playstyle from Nice on the Echo, and he's going on these flanks, and he's yeah. putting in all this damage. Okay, this time this is Shock kind of adapting to it, so it's going to be Choi and Striker and FD God playing Slurp in this 3-3, just trying to basically stop them from taking this approach. But when Nero's not running the Echo, it does kind of force the Shock to try and play in this manner. Ooh. Striker is hitting some nasty shots. He is, yeah. Just watching this hit scan duel because it could be fairly defining too. Oh, there's the app matrix and they get eviscerated. This becomes very deadly trying to push into these high ground areas. The Toronto Defiant need their DPS to open things up for them. These off angles need to get value in order for San Francisco Shock to pull back from the choke points. Otherwise, when Sato and Michelle try and take the high ground, they are just going to get blizzarded, may walled off. Uh, push with the Supercharger, push with Gravitic Flux. All of these tools benefit from having the Toronto tanks run through very tight corridors. It's only Aspire and Nice that can gain value by going on these big flanks, and they need to be getting that value. They certainly do. And that time bank that Toronto had built up, I mean, that's going to get whittled down over time because the Shock have now put themselves in a very good position to get this full hold on checkpoint B. And that might seem outlandish, me saying that out loud, but look at the ultimates here. If they rotate them effectively, they might be finding themselves in a pretty good position to do so. Nice actually moves over to the Sigma, but okay, they actually did push Choi to the low ground. He takes out a Spire though, trading one for one. Nice needs to get something done here. Gravitic Flux will connect, Striker, will he fall? Yes, Great combo. he will, nice. That's fantastic, into the melee as well. Now the Valkyrie gets popped as a response. Oh, but no one's here to deal with nice and as I was singing the praises of the shock they just stumble and fall and now control has flipped back over here for the Toronto Defiant in terms of the positioning that they're pushing in here with ultimates have to get forced out though this might be enough to turn it smurf with the pick on nice is absolutely supreme he was doing so much damage in the team fight does that rock connect not quite Michelle Almost. dodges underneath but they've used two tank ultimates and here's a bastion on the field yeah Nero going with the stall pick I like to see that. Striker goes down, but will be rezzed up, so that's uh, counteracted almost immediately. Smurf is taking a lot of damage, but that looked like the Defiant's best opportunity here. They invested every single ultimate they had, and now they're going to be looking for just essentially raw pickoffs. I don't think that plays nicely into the way that Shock are playing. I mean, they've got the positioning, the Halt doesn't connect, but only a minute remaining, and Toronto are kind of, kind of split off. They're forced to try and play their hand here. But also Toronto don't have to get through any tight choke points. So Nero's May, it's not going to be as effective. They have a little bit of high uh -oh. ground control. Uh-oh, Michelle, he's got to get out of there and recharge yeah. his shield. But when they have an opportunity to push in again... Okay, Ooh. never mind. That's the Amp wow. Matrix and an Icicle coming through it. That's such a good shot by Nero at long range. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if there's going to be the res for that. The positioning, it might be too out in the open for them to even attempt it. Uh, to be honest with you. Uh, but a shock, yeah, they've sent blood in the water. They're like, this is an opportunity. Nice is down, they're not going for the res. They're just taking up positioning as well. Uh, just backing off, they don't want to be losing a player or two. Down to the last 30 seconds now, Josh. They're trying to push in with a bunch of damage coming through that ant matrix. Great halt into oh, the wow. dynamite as well. That's Does quite built. a bit of damage and it. it forces out the immortality field. The player I'm looking at again though is nice. If they're able to tickle the point and activate overtime here, he will have a duplicate. Well, ready and waiting, holding down these ultimates again. It's all on Toronto to try and make the play. Oh, Bob oh, comes in and he's right in the back line. Oh, do they have anything to deal with it? The double shield is there. 
But they're playing these off angles perfectly, and Troy is just rolling over them once more. Spire takes but out FD Garden, right. gets rest back up the point, almost going their way. Has to be blocked up here. Nice. A great accretion connects onto Nero, but the freeze will come through. But he's going to be fought out of it as he fades out of the duplicate form. Still alive, still in action, and he's going to be above the point. The Toronto Defiant trying, trying to make Wait. this happen now with a couple of the stall picks moving into the ball onto the high ground. They need to deal with this ant matrix, but they've been pushed off the point. Can anyone no touch way. this one? Oh my goodness, just in time. FD got going to be flying straight onto the Valkyrie, gets the res onto Violet as well. So the Defiant will be stopped, but oh my word, that was close. 96% was what they were working with there. Score. Woo! That really was squeaky at the end there. Uh, San Francisco Shock will be rubbing their palms all moist after that one. That is a difficult point. Uh, that, that is a difficult situation to be in, honestly, because the Shock's defense was fantastic on point B. They held them at like 52% for a long, long time. And then in that final engagement, even though the Shock were winning the fight, they had to give up ticks on the point. And so despite the fact that Shock's B defense was so good, They've given up 96%. This is still winnable for the Toronto Defiant. It feels like a hard meta to be able to full complete on Hanamura right now. Unless the Shock have got some comp like this in their in their pocket that they, they want to go for. Yeah. Seems quite difficult for them. Uh, Overall, the Bren... I, yeah, I, would, I just want to point out how good Nystan Aspire... Or how well, sorry. Nystan Aspire are playing right now. Uh, Aspire is being able to get out a huge amount of damage, overperforming expectations massively. But Neist's Echo is just so great in this meta. His timings for his flank engagements, and also just being able to prod damage from off angles constantly, his sticky bomb usage, the timings he finds for that, he's always getting big value onto the San Francisco Shock. And his duplicates are still being able to get picks too. Part of the reason they're able, even able to get 96% is because his duplicate was so good at isolating Choyoba. Nice. I mean, yeah, we sing his praises often. Feels like every time we're covering the Toronto Defiant. And, uh, yeah, finding these positions. Now, the Shock with their composition, they're just trying to get in through the choke point quickly. FD God gets caught, though. And, uh, yeah, you're going to be missing the Lucio. You're missing the speed boost now with that composition. Not ideal. Uh, this time, Nero is on the Echo, so... His job is to essentially try and keep Nice in check, but when Nice has the damage boost as well, he, yeah, Nero's job gets made a lot more difficult. Nice has that Mercy Pocket, and he's just kind of keeping what? Nero and FD got at bay. Wow, that's so well played. All of that damage got converted into Coalescence Charge, and Anson yeah. J got ripped out of the air. I don't know what window of opportunity they found. Maybe it was just Anson J using, uh, using his flight or what. I'm not too sure, but... Take Anson J out early on, and they want a little bit more here. The Shock just biting down, committing to this fight. Might be able to get this kill into Nice as well, they do. So, yeah, they've completely cleared the Defiant off the point. Really impressive for them to be able to spot that in that one moment. That's a fantastic engagement. That, that, that one fight is like Shock at their peak, back again. Just identifying a tiny opportunity based on a cooldown being used. I assume the same as you, Brent, that it was just based off Ansun J using Guardian Angel. And Violet snipes him out of midair as everybody else jumps in. Let's take a look at this again. This was that pick. Just gets up to the Coalescence after Nice did a bunch of damage to the tanks. And there oh, we yeah, go. It That's was. what it was. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, that Guardian is... Guardian Angel a little close. It's what you were talking about, Josh. The killer instinct. The, the shot seemed to have it's been It's right missing. there. Yeah. Uh, but rearing its head every now and then. Duplicate online again for Nice. You can see him playing aggressive because of it. He knows that he can uh, get out of jail for free with that one. Uh, but Ultimate's coming online for Defiant. And if the Shock going to be playing hard and fast into it, they could be met with a nasty surprise. The Prophetic Flux, perhaps, the Ant Matrix. They're going to try and do it now. Coalescence is online, and here we go. Unleash cleaving through them. Drop to the low ground. Actually, pretty good disengagement here from the Shock. It's a good disengage, for sure, but it, they also use their Coalescence. So we're going to have to wait for another one of those to probably come online before they feel comfortable engaging again. Even the Sound Barrier is not a great tool to be able to get in through the choke points. Now, having said that, they still do have access to Primal Rage, a Diva Bomb Duplicate. A lot of those tools can also be used to make space, and it looks like they want to use it again here as the Speed Boost comes back online. That's a great accretion from Michelle. Pushes Smurf just away from the team, but now leaping back into a Gravitic Flux. Sends in, Aspire goes down! 
Oh my goodness, that was a dead eye from the high ground. Striker was ready and waiting for it. Took him out. That could have been brutal. And now with Nice to Michelle falling as well. The primal rage of Smurf is doing way too much work disrupting them. The Toronto oh, Defiant. Wow. It was looking so good for them, but it's over oh. just like wow. that. What was that? And that, Bren, is shock level domination. As soon as they swap over to the more rush-based composition, they rolled over the Toronto <laughs> Defiant. And that is just, that is that killer instinct again, man. They yeah, just identify yeah. how to combo their, mostly in this comp, it's actually their ultimates, not necessarily just their abilities. But being able to find that engagement with the speed boost and then primal into the back and using the other ultimates to create space as well, like the sound barrier, striker finding the pick off on the McCree as well. He wasn't going with the bulk of the team. It's so smart. It's so smart. And this is now really interesting. The better teams get with that Moira Lucio comp, the more the meta opens itself up a lot. It certainly does. Yeah, I, you know, you can catch yourself as a commentator as well, wondering, am I being too biased towards the shock in that moment? And as I was thinking that, they just end up winning the map. So um, I, I think I was singing their <laughs> praises quite, quite accurately for that moment. But we'll find out on the other side of things that the Toronto Defiant are going to be coming back into this one. Of course, they've got the map on the board. That's one step of the way. They, maybe they can take it a little bit further. It is map point after all to the shock. We're going to see on the other side of it whether the series will be concluding. Coca-Cola is the official refreshment of the Overwatch League.
Welcome back, everybody, from the break. And yeah, I've got a little bit of. Hold on. There we go. Yeah, sorry, I took a took a sip of tea just before we went in. I've got honey in it, and the honey is like you know <laughs> makes, makes my mouth water. And that was a bad idea okay. as we were coming. I was you like, had a very in the countdown. Mouth. Yeah, I, I heard. I was hearing the countdown. I was like, oh no, this isn't going to go well. But there we go. Just you know, I'm going to be brutally <laughs> honest. That was what happened there. Um, yeah, we're we're in the middle of this series, two to one currently for the Toronto Defiant not letting up. And I want to toot my own horn for a little bit here, Josh, if that's okay. Okay. Um, toot away. You know, me. And I think of Ast as well, actually, in terms of like analysts in the overall scene, um, were some of the only people that were pretty high up on the Defiant coming into this season. Now, granted, I was also really low on Houston and Dallas, so take everything okay. I say with a massive grain of salt. But <laughs> I've always seen promise of this squad, and I think it's still here, it's still there. Yeah, this is a decent team. They've got all the pieces they need to be able to succeed. To me, it comes down. Essentially, the difference between all top teams in Overwatch is how good they are at being able to play off each other, how good their coordination is, and how good they are able to sync up their abilities with each other and time everything together. And then also, yeah. how well do you actually understand the meta that you're playing? And, and Toronto Defiant in the main melee looked like they had a pretty decent grasp of it. And then once they played against better teams, we realized, okay, they weren't actually at that elite level despite being a, a team that had got a lot of regular season success. And then in this meta, in the June Joust, they came out playing a lot of Winston. It didn't look as great, even though they were being able to get wins on the board. And yet now, in this series against the San Francisco Shock, they've shown us some Arissa that has looked very competent. Aspire and Nice have done a great job working around Sato and Michelle's core to give them this really dangerous look. However, the Shock is still the Shock. Their Lucio Moira comp just destroyed them on Hanamura. And that could definitely be played more as we go deeper in the, seri uh, in the series. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and Glister is back in for Striker here. Okay. So the Glister saga is going to continue, um, as well as, you know, we're obviously waiting on Violet to get back from the bathroom, wherever he is. I don't know what Violet's doing, you know, we're seeing an empty chair at the moment. But uh, let's talk about his statistics, at least, while he's gone as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, this guy's, uh, this guy's numbers in this match so far, and he's putting up some pretty good ones. Uh, the depth yeah. for minutes, a low environmental, f or the immortality fields, I should say. Uh, prevented for 10 minutes. That is nice and tasty as well at 2.8. Uh, Violet's just a great player. I mean, it's it's not a hot take, but I'm going to keep saying it. He's a fantastic player. People sometimes maybe forget how incredible he is. Even, even the heroes that we weren't as high on Violet playing last season, he's done a job at improving. He's, yeah. His Moira has been excellent in this series so far. It was previously a hero where maybe he'd be a little too individualistic or wouldn't be thinking about his team at the right times and didn't have the greatest idea of what he wanted to be doing in the team fights. Sometimes he was using his fades a little too aggro so he didn't have them and it was ended up getting punished. I don't see that happening in these series. Whenever he's pulled out the Moira in 2021, it has looked like a good pick for him. And he's part of, <laughs> he's a very big part of the reason that they were able to crush on Hanamura. Certainly is. Uh, we're heading over to Hollywood, and yeah, it's all glamour when it comes to this map. Although they do a good job, I think the uh, the Overwatch designers, the map designers, and the art team of really, you know, showing the the kind of the veil, you know. I suppose oh, you know it's all side of Hollywood. yeah, it's it's all pretty, and then you turn around a corner, and then it's just there's just litter and garbage. You know, if you, anybody who's ever been to Hollywood will know what I'm talking about here. Right, right. Um, yeah, Bren's very industry. He knows I'm very like industry. I mean, there. I don't, I don't, I don't live um, there anymore. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I did live there. He had a he had a short career in the pictures. <laughs> in the pictures. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was a I was a hand model as well. A hand model, a hand really? Model. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. With those brutish fists? Exactly, yeah. As soon as I started lifting, I was out of the industry. They're very, very <laughs> strict. Very uh, strict. Fair enough. Uh, that anyway, makes good sense. enough about my fake backstory here. The Shock are one map away from taking away Hollywood. And they are going to be playing this no, double wow. shield. Glister is on the <laughs> ash. Yeah, I, I really like that, Brent. They're one map away from taking Hollywood. Yeah, they, you could say that about any team that's going into Hollywood. But they're also one <laughs> yes. map away from okay, taking right. the series. Yeah, that's what I meant to say, but uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, what a shot! Aspire continues to be dangerous here. He has just kept it up throughout the entire series. The res comes through, of course, but the additional damage has just kept Chuck penned up in the choke. Yeah, that's a nice early pick. I mean, it burns the res early as well, um, which you got to think is a big, it's a big cooldown. Don't, they don't really have the composition to to play off of that kind of timing, though. Aspire is being pressured heavily, has to back off underneath, grab that mini health pack. And he's, uh, yeah, he's playing a bit of a self-sufficient style. You can see him not really receiving too many heals there from Lastro. Oh, look at this angle, though, that's being taken. The shock. Okay, they've sent something, and they found the positioning off the back of it. Nice. And Anson J and Lastro are going to be going down. And only a couple of players left standing between them and the point. The shock will be claiming their prize. Checkpoint A going down. Without too many issues. Really, really nice play there. They pushed Aspire out of Cafe and then took it immediately. They walked into the point, used their shields properly. Choyobin got placed up in the Cafe area, and then he's just at an off angle where he's almost unstoppable. Him and Nero combining together to get picks, get damage through. And that's, that is fantastic. That's what makes Chock so dangerous on hybrid maps as well. Last year, they were essentially defined by their success on control and on hybrid. They're still amazing at hybrid maps. And the cart will steadily move forward until Toronto deem it safe to, I guess, kind of engage. Uh, they want to play from this high ground position here as well, so they can spam them from above, put in a bit of that chip damage. They get pulled up, pulled together. Another Hulk comes out, actually, into the Ant Matrix. <gasps> nice, just trying to deal with them, has to use the duplicate, because Glister actually popped in quite low there, so the ultimate's going to be used on either side. This is a weird series of events. Nero dropping down as well. Finally, the Bob comes through. Might be fading in just a moment here. A lot of you. Oh, okay. A lot of the abilities coming through on either side. No real casualties, actually. But finally, something's got to break. And eventually it does. Toronto's still trying to hold on, though. Michelle dropping down, using that grass to stay alive. Just trying to pressure them and push them off, buying space for this DPS duo. I don't know if that accretion actually connected, but Troy. Okay, no, he did get the Gravitic Flux off. Michelle will go down. And uh, yeah, they're being pressured from the high ground, but the Shock are doing a good job of just kind of playing it out. And especially Glister, the longer this guy's alive, the more value he's been getting. He's had some great moments at Choi Obin as well, dominating these off angles, finding that fantastic Gravitic Flux over onto Michelle. And his shield value has also been superb at stopping Aspire. That's the, that's the real key to me as well. Aspire and Nice have been so incredible this series that it's on Choyobin to make sure this Ash does not find value. You can see Aspire at the top of your screens right now trying to dominate that high ground, looking for an angle up at the top. Already 71% of the next Bob. So that could be a, a tool that they have access to, but really I'm looking at the tank ultimates with Sado and Michelle gearing up to the supercharger and the gravitating flux. But here we go again. <laughs> Choyobin takes control of the high ground, pushes Aspire away, and this is what makes them so, so good at hybrid. Just being able to control the areas that the cart is about to push into. The map control is just phenomenal from the shot. Yeah, Toronto have to dedicate some resources, some bodies into trying to take this away, but the Shock are just rolling forward here. The Holt is going to get taken out here. Oh, look at this. Michelle and Nero traded out on either side. Uh, there's the res coming through with the Immortality Field to keep them up and alive. Okay, Bob as well onto the point, so the Toronto Defiant just holding on. There we go, Glister goes down. The Shock going to choose to disengage from this one. And it's a good disengage, but they do lose a couple of players nevertheless, because Toronto have got that that feeling in their bones. They can Ooh. smell blood in the water. And Aspire kills three people there, including a Bob. A Bob kill halfway through. Here comes the res, so they don't have to wait for the respawn queue. Three and a half minutes on the clock, so there's, we're still very, very far away from crunch time here for the San Francisco shot. But nevertheless, they want to get going. They've got a Bob of their own to try and contest. Get deep inside that final checkpoint. And Nero's duplicate, he's probably going to be looking for Michelle if he can. Yeah, but the fine have got a couple of ults of their own, and this time, look at how strongly they're trying to fight over this. <gasps> oh, that was so well played! The oh, hold into the accretion and the stickies! Yeah, that is summon else. That is a beautiful little play, and look at this! The space that Nero has been granted doesn't have the duplicate in time! Oh my goodness, Nice got brought back up and just, again, punishes it, but they don't take out the res. Nice, though, he's going to be duplicating over to the Sigma himself, and it's a fight that's occurring on two fronts. Onto the high ground and the low ground. The Shock continue to try and fight this one. Glister ends up using the ultimate as Bob gets sent straight into it, but Toronto Defiant answering back almost immediately. Michelle getting so much work done with his own Gravitic Flux. 
And they've got the better spawns as well. So the shock, it's an even traded out team fight, but ultimately it will be defined into the ones that are coming out on top. Despite the fact that they got that early pick on Nice, they weren't really able to capitalize on any of the space. Toronto played around that so beautifully, trapping Nero, making it difficult for him to push in. And then Nero was forced to duplicate an Orisa. Didn't really get value out of the supercharger, but Michelle had already killed two. Here we go with the real supercharger, though. Smurf lays it down. Decent LOS. Oh. That's going to trap Sado, and he gets Ooh. melted immediately. That is so much damage, and it forces out the immortality field. Aspire has no idea what's occurring. The high ground is completely in control. And Nero with the heal, with the pocket. It's going to try and do a bit more damage to this back line, but it's just a cherry on top once more as the Shock are going to be gliding that payload in one minute, 52 seconds. A nice completion here for Hollywood in a typically much, uh, much more difficult area of the map to try and push through. A minute and 52 seconds is brutal for the Toronto Defiant to have to match. That, even if they get it in overtime, it's drawable at worst for San Francisco. They just look like beasts. And to me, it's Choi Obin. That's the player that I'm looking at all the time because he gets himself and is escorted, to be fair. It's not just him doing it on his own, but the presence of mind that the Shock has to get Choi Obin into those aggressive positions where he can dominate sight lines and just lock off areas. Uh, Aspire can't fight in the positions he wants to because there's a Sigma shield in his face, a Sigma damage in his face as well. Yeah. And then once Choyobin is set up on those high grounds, he can rain through damage at an off angle that just contributes chip damage over and over again. And he becomes so difficult to punish up there. It's part of what has made the Shock a, a dominant force in the last last season at least with Sigma being so prevalent. But even if you think back to 2019, a year of goats, sure, but when they actually closed it out in the playoffs, it's Choi Obin Sigma. Yeah, Choi is, uh, yeah, I mean, the guy is unreal at a variety of the roles when it comes to the off-tank position. Certainly one of my favorite players to watch. And, uh, yeah, the presence of mind, the game sense, that's the thing that it really enables the shock and uh, the adaptations they're making to try and shut out what was working for the Defiant. The Shock are going to be holding onto this high ground again with a double shield. And it's a lot of spam, a lot of damage that's coming through from them from on high. Troy just dropping down to the corner for now. Holt's not going to connect. And that actually gives Toronto a bit of a window. You see Nice playing quite aggressive as soon as, as soon as he realized the Holt actually didn't connect onto anything. Looping their way around the back it gives them an opportunity to find some picks. But look at this. Immediately, Troy Oban FD got they've gone up onto the high ground here as well. So taking some high ground control away now that the Toronto Defiant have rotated around the floor. But that's oh, such oh, a good play oh. by Nice. Up and over the top, slaughters them all. Oh my god. And yeah, the shock they were playing split up in this 3-3 style. But uh, ultimately, it's Nice of the damage boost is the one who's doing all the damage. Those flanks that, honestly, he's becoming very well known for now in the Overwatch League. He always finds just immaculate timings. Yeah, that is gorgeous. Another little flank. It was very difficult for them to have any idea where Nice was coming from, and he just sweeps over the top of the building. Let's take a look at it from his point of view. He gets the info from the rest of his team that they're up there, pushes away the DPS just oh. for a moment, and then the sticky bombs into the focusing beam. Ooh, and then some gorgeous try shot at the end as well. Every yep. part of the kit utilized perfectly there from Echo. That is nasty. And the Defiant with a hefty time bank going to be looking to try and get this now through checkpoint B. The Shock still with a pretty firm grasp on this high ground and it, it allows them to dictate the pace of this next team fight actually. They can choose to engage whenever they want. The Defiant trying to match them actually, ult for ult. The Amp Matrix is laid down. Oh, nice 40 had a moment of respite, not going to be happening. Has to just weave his way in and out. And it is steady progress being gained here, but the longer this happens, the more likely it is that a window of opportunity ends up happening here. You can see Glisser just putting in the, the damage. The coach gun, nice, has to use the duplicate just to try and survive this one. And the fight is also occurring on the other side of things. So Gravitic Flux from Choi, just about connecting on top of, I think, Bob and the Spire, actually. So it sets them up for the kill. And nice, not going to be walking away with that kill. Defiant just going to be oh, wow. probably losing this one. <laughs> nice kill, though. Okay, just gonna yeah, he's 4 HP. He doesn't have a chance of staying alive, but he's just hiding out there in the saloon. 
Rez comes out onto Violet as well, though, so it's not even dangerous for the shock. They're still going to have access to all of their healing. And they still have some big ults to work with as well. This is a tough part of the map to be able to push. The Shock were able to do it because they had momentum coming into this area and they, they found some picks as well. But it's, it's hard. Even after the change, I mean, remember that this is some of the first times that we're being able to see Hollywood with the new elevators. You don't have to wait for them to come down to you, they <laughs> wait for true. you. Incredible. Yeah. Revolutionary. Brand new technology. <laughs> Yeah, it is nice to see. It does change, actually, how the pace of these fights is, is taken as well. It allows you to contest the high ground whenever you want if you can avoid a lot of the damage that's coming your way. But now the Shocker in pretty good position. Three minutes still, though, for the Defiant. Look at that. A lot of damage. Aspire has to back off around the corner. This Supercharger is still up, though. And it means that the spam that's being sent up there is going to be cracking these shields every now and then. Uh, but eventually, the Superchargers will fade on either side. And it looks like the Shock want to be taking the initiative as they lay down the Amp Matrix. That's not the thing that gets the kill, though. In fact, Nero with the damage boost, the Sticky Bombs did a lot of that. And the Shock, again, going to be pouncing on their targets, finding multiple pickoffs. Absolutely brutalized there. And Michelle is surely going to fall at some point. Oh, perhaps not, actually. He's managed to back off into security. To me, Brent, the way that the Toronto Defiant need to play is much more centered around baiting the Shock in. They know that the Shock are going to drop on them to contest the payload at some point, right? They have high ground advantage, they can do a lot of poke, but at some point they are going to drop down and contest. So Toronto need to anticipate that and catch them. Whether they're catching them with a Gravinic Flux or an Ant Matrix or a Duplicate, whatever. But you need a plan for when the Shock actually commit to the fight. That's a lot of damage on Sado. Oh my goodness, and now the ults are being committed. The Fortify gets used, so Sado's going to be avoiding the worst of it, but... Okay, Michelle tries to even it out once more after Lastro goes down. Won't be happening. Holt's going to get blocked up by a bunch of these shields, and in fact, it's a little bit of a later immortality field. Still, they're falling very, very low. They've Duplicates and ultimates in. all coming out, and yet the bait comes through. Is it enough, though? Do they have the damage to try and withstand what the Shock are outputting right now? It doesn't look like it. It's on a knife's edge, though, at any moment. Just a rare bit of spam, a stray headshot might be enough to try and turn the battle. But the Shock are going to be regaining control of this high ground position. Dynamite is going to be uh, whiffing there from Blister, but don't worry. We switched away from it quickly. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't caught on cam. Violet's Ant Matrix was the thing that really pushed back the Toronto Defiant in the previous Whoa. fight. There's another halt into the accretion, and Violet ends up getting the kill. Damage boosted as well. All the assists, everybody on the team taking part. A minute remaining, and uh, there will no be... There will not be the res online, I suppose, on CJ going down. These are going to be some nasty, nasty stagger kills. Oh, they're going straight for the jugular here. Yeah. Not going to be getting that brutal. kill on the Sado, but it is, it is it, brutal. It feels like, Bren, even if they were able to win every team fight from here on out, we'd probably be in overtime anyway. The Shock have done enough at this point. Checkpoint yep. B is just so difficult to push. You have to have a masterful understanding of what the opponents are going to be doing. And the Shock have just been able to chain these ultimates, keep their ult economy booming the entire time. FD God is dancing with death when he's playing in these line of side angles. <gasps> okay, Glister's Revenge. The damage boost to kill there onto a spy. It's going to be instantly rezzed up, but now your Mercy wasn't really healing your team up in that fight. Sado chunked down to half HP to fortify. Uh, is it going to be faded there? And it means the Gravitic Flux gets a lot of work done. Glister may have stepped himself a little bit over there, but in the end, oh yeah, that is just an immense amount of work being put in, and no one is going to be capable of touching this one on the Toronto Defiant side. So the Shock going to be running away with it, three to one. And as I said at the start of see, uh, the series here, Josh, you know they have uh, the winner of that map wins Hollywood. They did, they did win Hollywood. <laughs> they won the series as well, actually. In fact, yeah, 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 yeah. They won Hollywood, though. I they love did. the fact that Glister was put back in, though, Brent. He was given an opportunity to redeem himself after losing that map previously on Junkertown. Yeah. And yeah. he showcased that he is a, a good player. He was able to put up a huge amount of damage there, very intelligent with the positions he was taking, and was part of their dominant victory. Um, I, I love that. It, it kind of indicates to me that the San Francisco Shock want Lister to be more of a long-standing player in this meta. If you're only playing long-range hitscan, play Glister. If you have to also rotate to play the Reaper, well then now Striker can play that because you, he can play long range hits down and the Reaper in those more Relucian rush compositions. That is the vibe I'm getting from Shock's strategy from what they've showcased in their first match of the June Joust.
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a lot of confidence as well, like we were saying, uh, or like I was saying as well. I mean, when you're playing those, those long range hits and the hit scan rolls, sometimes you do just need a shake of the shoulders and, and somebody to tell you, listen, you know, we've got a lot of trust in you. We have faith in you. We wouldn't have picked you up to play on the San Francisco Shock if you weren't a good player. And uh, yeah, he uh, he ended up redeeming himself in the final moments there. Quite happy with that as well. So probably going to yeah. be shutting down some of the naysayers. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, overall, absolutely. definitely definitely a little bit scrappy here and there. But let's take a look at our player of the match, uh, presented by Xfinity. Uh, for this series overall, opted to actually give it to Violet. Um, for really the initiative that was being taken, I think, across the board. Statistically, this guy was putting up fantastic numbers as well the entire series. And once again, just uh, really cementing himself as one of the more uh, stable, I think, foundations for this team. The San Francisco Shock seems to always be able to rely on Violet. It's rare for him to have an off game. Yeah, he's one of our greatest of all time candidates, to be honest. If it, if the San Francisco Shock manages to get a three-peat, he'll 100% be up there with Choyobi. And people will be asking how he couldn't be the greatest of all time. But there are still questions that were asked this season about Violet's Moira and about his Anna. And I think today we saw a Moira that looked vastly improved from what we've seen in prior seasons and was part of what made that composition look so excellent for them. And the BAP, as you can see, statistically, remains the best in the world. There's nobody <laughs> who's on Violet's level. You can you can you can bring alarm if you love him and you can see yeah. if he stacks up. But he's not gonna. Violet's the best bap in the world. He's just Ooh, unbelievable. The word. damage he's able to put out, the healing, the positioning. He takes risks where other people wouldn't dare and it pays off. It certainly does, yeah. Uh, and we've got a nice little interview as well to hear a little bit more from the San Francisco Shock. Danny, I believe he's got Smurfs. So take it away, Danny. Brendan Josh, thank you very much. Welcome to Game Break presented by Cheez It Grooves, everybody. We're joined now by Smurf from San Francisco Shock. Smurf, congratulations on the big win today. Smurf 선수, 안녕하세요. 그리고 오늘 승리 너무나도 축하드립니다. 아, 감사합니다. 감사합니다. Smurf says thank you. All right, let's get on with the uh, player interview for Smurf. So, um, I would say, you know, although San Francisco Shock seemed a little shaky in the first half, you guys were able to turn things around eventually um, during the second half. So what changes did you guys sort of make after losing Junkertown? 그첫 번째 질문은 일단 제가 봤을 때는 좀 이제 첫 번째 한첫 번째 맵두 번째 맵에 살짝 어좀어 어, 쇼기 원래 이렇게 하는 것처럼 안은 좀 이렇게 힘들어하는 모습을 보였던 것 같아요. 그러다가 이제 정커 타운이 끝난 다음에 어, 확실히 좀 이렇게 완벽하게 돌아온 거 돌아온 거 같은데 돌아와서 이제 좀 승리를 거두시게 된것 같은데 어 정커 타운 이후 좀 어떤 조정이 있, 있었나요? 어 일단 첫 번째랑 두 번째 맵 같은 경우에는 이제 저희가 연습했던 것만큼 잘안 나오기도 했고 실수도 좀 많이 했어가지고 이제 정커타운 끝나고 나서는 이제 감독님이랑 코치님이랑 얘기 많이 하고 저희 이제 문제점을 찾았던 것 같아요. So in the first and, <clears throat> first and second second map, um, I feel like we sort of couldn't play to our potential. How we practiced, um, like how, the the things that we worked on, the, the practice that we made, we just didn't come out, and we also made a lot of mistakes in the first two maps. So I feel like that's why it was it seemed a little bit close. After that, uh, coming into the third map, we definitely talked a lot to lot a lot about the match, a uh, lot about what we had to do with our coaches, and that's when we made the adjustments, and that's how we won the map or we won the. Map. Match. All right, go, going into my second question for you, Smurf. Uh, you are actually going up against the Dallas Fuel tomorrow, a team that knocked out the Shock and ultimately won the main melee tournament. Uh, but that was on the past, right? And we are in the June Joust right now with a different hero rotation. Do you believe Dallas Fuel is just as strong as they were in the main, me main melee? 그두 번째 질문은 이제 스포프 선수도 아시다시피 이제 아쉽게 어 5월 토너먼트에서 이제 달라스 팀에게 져서 어 탈락을 하시게 되셨는데 이제 지금 6월 토너먼트 이제 좀 새로운 토너먼트잖아요. 이제 또, 또 이제 영웅 로테이션도 다르고 밴도 이제 또 들어오게 됐고 영웅 밴도 이제 들어 이제 영입이 됐는데 어 이런 거를 다 통틀어서 스포프 선수가 보시기에 달라스 팀이 어 5월 토너먼트에서의 그 그런 좀 강적이었는데 아직까지도 그렇게 좀 강적이라고 생각을 하시나요? 음 이제 저희가 5월 메이 밀리 때 델러스한테 지고 나서 이제 저희도 이제 델러스의 템포 같은 거 빠르다고 느끼고 저희도 배울 점이 많다고 생각하고 이제 저희도 이제 토너먼트 끝나고 굉장히 많은 준비를 해왔기 때문에 이제 델러스전에서 최선을 다하려 하고 있어요. 
All right, so definitely, um, I feel like in the main melee, uh, Dallas Fear was a very strong team. They had a very strong, very fast tempo, and there was a lot to learn from the Dallas team, and we definitely learned a lot after playing uh, against the Dallas Fuel in main melee. But coming into the June Joust, uh, we actually prepped a lot. We have a lot up our sleeves, so um, we're going to just prepare as much as possible, do the best as we can for a match against the Dallas Fuel tomorrow. All right, Smurf, thank you so much. Good luck tomorrow. 내일 어 파이팅 하시길 바라고요. 그럼 내일 또 뵙도록 Thank 하겠습니다. 스마프 선수 감사합니다. 감사합니다. Alright, thank you so much. Let's head back to the desk. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you, Smurf. Congratulations to the San Francisco Shock on that victory. But, you know, I still want to talk about Toronto. Yeah, they did not get the W, but their 30-day mercenary aspire is a win in and of itself. Um, Casta, any first uh, thoughts on the impressions from aspire in this match? Yeah, the question, I, I think that's one of the best like debut performances we've seen, especially from someone who's a short-term sub. Aspire played incredibly well. Imagine being asked in the short term by the Toronto Defiance, like, hey, we want to shine, sign you to a short-term contract. It's all right, all right, we're just playing against the San Francisco Shock. They're pretty easy. Uh, he comes in <laughs> and he just puts on an absolute monstrous performance against Glister, against Stryker, against the whole team. And I think he proved that he can play at this level. He went above and beyond that. I think he really just put in so much space. And he it wasn't even like he was getting more space. They were playing different compositions. Just straight head to head, he was doing his job. And that's all he, the, the Toronto Defiant needed from him. And they got a map, they made it close. You know, you can't ask for anything better. So big shout out to Spy and big shout out to you know, the Contenders region, pro proving once again that there's so much talent out there that hasn't been really touched yet. Yeah, no, he, he really did phenomenal. That was a great debut performance from Aspire. And honestly, I hope to see a lot more of him. And if, if teams are not getting that contract ready to sign, and I don't know what they're doing, honestly. <laughs> and now San Francisco, they did win. But, you know, as people who want to see them doing really well, it is our responsibility to remain critical. So reinforced through the lens of a caring parent, what or rather who caught your eye in this match? Uh <laughs> Caring parent, I don't know what to do. I, I've only been a dog owner for a year. I, how, how are you supposed to be a parent? Um, no, I do think we need to talk about Glister though um, in this match. Of course, he's been on Junker Town and had a pretty bad performance, quite frankly. It did not look good for him. But you know, he redeemed himself on Hollywood. Um, I love what Sideshow was saying uh, that I was really happy that Glister actually was, was subbed in on Hollywood uh, for a chance of redemption, really, to prove that he is a good hit game player. And you know, he had some good shots, some good dynamites. Uh, but if you're talking about San Francisco Shocks, championship aspirations you know winning stages they won two stages last year can they do the same thing again this year um you really need to talk about glister in my opinion because he's supposed to be the star player uh, for this team alongside so many other star players uh, but he's replacing Ans, uh, who last year was of course the best hit scan in the league a phenomenal player and glister haven't really shown us anything super impressive so far um this year so that begs the question is Glister going to adapt to this team? You know, what does he provide to this team? What role does he fit in? Because last year, one of the big distinguishes be be between Ans and Glister currently is that Ans, he was just an aggressive maniac. Like, he got so <laughs> many first kills. It was absurd. Like, he was leading the first kill column by, like, multiple percentages because it was just absurd. Glister, on the meanwhile, he's playing rather passive. Like, rather scared. Like, he doesn't want to take these big swing angles to try to hit impressive shots. And that was Aspire did. And that's why we are so impressed with Aspire, because he hits some nasty shots. But Glister, you know, he peels back a little bit more. He doesn't, he isn't as proactive. So um, I'm really interested to see more from Glister this stage. You know, good signs to see him on the hitscan roll and not Violet back on it again. Um, <laughs> but yes, I want to see more from Glister because I truly believe that if San Francisco Shock are supposed to be a championship contender again this year, they really need to unlock Glister and get the best performances out of him. Right on. Now, it is time to move on to our next match, and that is, of course, going to be played out between Atlanta Rain and the LA Gladiators. And that means it's crunch time, presented by Cheesy Grooves. Costa, I have to I have to throw this one to you. You are the one picking the Gladiators. What do they need to roll up with in order to take down the Atlanta Rain? Honestly, it's funny. We usually talk a lot about strategy, a lot about differences. I actually think Atlanta and Gladiators are playing a very similar style. Obviously, Atlanta is leaning more towards that double shield for the most part, but Gladiators showed a willingness to play that themselves. They are more comfortable on the dive, but I honestly think it's just going to be about execution for both of these teams. 
they've been rather lackluster from both sides in the main melee and they're making their rises again. This is a really great sort of test for both teams of which one is better, who is going to be making that sort of irk into the top ends and are they going to be qualifying because both of these teams need the wins for this June Joust to get higher seeding, to get higher chances to make it to these playoffs. So I'm personally looking out for Kevs to vs Pelican though. I think the Echoes are the most important heroes on this game right now and I think both of them have been incredible thus far. So I don't know, just sick gameplay. That's all I'm looking out for. Sick gameplay. Sick It's all he's play. asking for, all right? He's not asking too much. Um, reinforce quickly getting your thoughts. I think one of the things we pointed out yesterday looking at the performance of the Gladiators was they felt a bit timid. They were holding back. Um, you think they can step it up today against Atlanta Rain? Yeah, I mean, I, I hope we see some aggression from them or some more confidence because there was some hesitation, like you said. So um, I would like to see them take it to the Atlanta Rain, play with confidence, really go in there and challenge the tanks as well as uh, what Costa said. I, I think that Echo battle is going to be of huge importance between Kevster and Pelican, but also Kai, you know, Kai is a yeah. fantastic hit scan player. How can Birdring challenge Kai and remove that pro? for the Atlanta Rain. Um, I think that's going to be an interesting uh, key matchup to look out for uh, in this upcoming match. Well, and the match is about to be ready, so let's get this show on its merry way. And for that, we once again want to send it over to our casters. We have our walking and talking quilt, and uh, he is joined <laughs> by Josh. Uh, it's, more like, um, it's more like a picnic cloth, I think, as opposed oh, to a quilt. You could picnic oh. on a quilt. No? Yeah, you can actually. My quilt does have a kind of a pattern like this, actually. So yeah, I've got that. Well, I like it. Yeah, I was no, yeah. there was no judgment in it. I was just being. No, of absurd. course, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, well, no, I, it was I, really I, mean. Actually, I think you should apologize. What? No, I was just, I was, <laughs> yes, no, I'm, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not offended. Sorry don't for listen apologizing, to even though listen. I don't mean it. Don't no, he's really him. sad. No, he's, he's projecting really his hairline. Don't oh listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to him. Um, yeah, I, li I like the setup, guys, as well, coming into this match here. I mean, you're really kind of hyping it up as well, the battle of DPS. I mean, both these two teams are so evenly matched in terms of, like, the overall standings as well that uh, I'm anticipating, hopefully, a slobber knocker of a game, but yeah. Yeah, Custer I mean, yeah. could look like a genius coming out of this, which would be a surprise, wouldn't it? So, jo I, I, oh, really okay, yeah. yeah. Josh, you want to come to the genius side? I know you're usually, you know, a little smooth rain, but you want to come over to the genius <laughs> side and kick the gladiators? <laughs> want to throw a wrinkle? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a caster, I have to remain unbiased, Custer. Unbiased. Oh, yeah. boy. To, 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 to win. <laughs> and with that being said, we're going to shift the conversation away from the desk as well. They've had their time in the sunlight and uh, goodbye, you know. They don't exist purely off photosynthesis, but if they did, <laughs> then I would, you know, I'm kind of just shoving them away. For, You'd be for starving them. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of grim, actually, now that I it talk is. about it. it that's kind of grim. Anyway, we're headed into the match. <laughs> it's the Atlanta Raid versus the, uh, the Los Angeles Gladiators. Um, and yeah, like we're saying, we're kind of hyping this one up to hopefully be a close one between these two teams. I mean, they're close on the standings. Yeah. They have so much going for them in terms of like the raw talent. You think about the matchups that they were hyping up, like Pelican versus Kevster, Bird Ring versus Kai. We may oh, see yeah. it come alive here today. I think we absolutely will. Let's take a look at the Atlanta starters, because both of these teams have a similar narrative. The Atlanta Reign is a team who had some level of excitement coming into this season. The community was a little split. On one hand, people were like, okay, this DPS lineup is unbelievable. There's no way that they can fail. And the other side was saying, well, Atlanta had a good roster last season and they still weren't able to perform. Atlanta now in the June Joust are trying to prove those doubters wrong. They are, essentially this match is a battle to enter tier one. Both of these teams have the potential to get there, but neither have really realized it yet. Uh, three and three record on the Atlanta Reign, three and two for the Los Angeles Gladiators. Whoever wins this is going to be looking good to enter that tier one and potentially make it to Hawaii for the June Joust. Yep, and that's where all eyes are on. I mean, Gator and Hawk is an individual you're seeing here in the center of your screens. These guys have been playing so, so well. Let's take a look at the Gladiators uh, and who they're going to be fielding today. There's not going to be too many surprises. I mean, I've already gassed up this DPS battle that's going to be occurring. Kevster and Birdrun, again, Kevster, we don't know what he looks like. Where's the cam? You know, where is the cam? <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's another mystery. He he is an international <laughs> man of mystery. And that also, I'm assuming, is not what he normally looks like. So, yeah, you know. Yeah, th this is an interesting one. I'm, I am also anticipating 
Shu, uh, sorry, Skewed being subbed in at various points as well. Because mm -hmm. their Orisa based compositions with Skewed and Skewed and Shu in the back lines, wow, that's a tongue twister, looked phenomenal yesterday when they essentially battered their way to the to the win. So I think this is gonna be a really interesting duel. Both teams have somewhat similar styles. They both feel confident playing the Orisa compositions if that's where we end up going. Um, although it's probably not where, where we're going to end up starting, considering the first map is Busan. Yeah, those clash of styles will be quite intriguing. I'm also really interested, actually, Josh, in uh, in seeing how far, or how strong the Gladiators are. I think against a team like the Atlanta Rain. The Atlanta Rain is such a momentum-based team that you know, if they get um, some of those early wins under their belt, they, they can really feel confident rolling into it. The Gladiators, I mean, they had a bit of an easy time of it the other day. It was uh, it was quite one-sided um, uh, against, I believe, it was London um, at the time. So, yeah, it's. This is going to be the test for me, I think, watching this, especially probably a lot of Gladiators fans at home as well, uh, wondering just how far their team goes, just to really hammer home at this kind of breaking into Tier 1 storyline that we're running with here. Yeah, and a reminder that the expectations for both of these rosters were really high coming into the league. Oh, uh, yeah. They were both Ready built to, to go deep, and as yet, that hasn't happened. Uh, this is a good opportunity, actually, Busan, to see what compositions these teams are favoring. You can run Arisa comps, you can run some kind of Winston or Ball compositions here as well. I would expect Atlanta Rain to be running essentially what you're looking at right now for the majority of this series. The Arisa Diva is the core of what Atlanta Rain have been able to get success with. And then Kai playing his long range hit scan and Pelican gonna flex over onto the Echo as well. Uh, and on the other side, we actually have Gladiators trying to play the Moira Lucio Rush composition, the like mm. mixture between dive and rush that we've been seeing so often. But this is a really open map to try and do it. Yeah, the issue that the Gladiators comp is going to have is trying to close the distance without taking too much damage. And so Atlanta are just trying to, gonna, they're going to try and spam them the entire time as they're trying to slowly gain positioning. Gladiators now. Might not have the speed boost just yet, but again, you can see them just working around the map, just hiding behind the walls, but it's the Atlanta Rain who are going to be taking the initiative. The Holt going to be pulling them back as they try and get split up into two, into twain. Look at this, the Gladiators finding a bit of work here. An early pick onto Gator. The point does slip over towards the Atlanta Rain, though, which is always nice for them, but it is a 5v6 fight, and as soon as the cooldowns come back on, Coalescence comes through. Bird Ring has to use that Rafe to try and back off. Finding it very difficult to remove Pelican out of this fight, but eventually he goes down, but not before Kele uh, Kevster also traded out. Still in this fight, though, Kai pumping in the damage. That was two headshots back to back, and Mop and Bird Ring will be falling, so it's looking kind of tasty for the Gladiators, but unfortunately not enough to try and rip it away from the Atlanta Rain. Atlanta are always going to be able to back off with their DPS. Their DPS players are two long-range hit scans, Kai and Pelican on the McCree and the Soldier 76. As they see Gladiators approaching, they can see them miles away. And all you have to do is track that speed boost and you are going to be able to out-rotate them. Gladiators have got a hard, hard job here to be able to get these engages working well. Constant disruption from the Atlanta tanks too. Oh, are they going to get booped into this one? Yo, there comes the boop, and that puts in the damage. Holy smokes, yep. Straight up, I mean, it's a, it's an age-old combo. We've seen it quite a lot, actually, these days. Yeah, uh, yeah, combos yeah. Combos up quite nicely. Definitely, we've been seeing much more, many more attempts at boops into Dead Eyes and self-destructs as well. Uh, we've also just been seeing more self-destructs online because the Echo has been played so much more, so. It's uh, it's definitely becoming a more uh, a combo that's fresh in people's minds and that they think of in the middle of matches. Here we go, Kevster though with duplicate and the coalescence. So speed boost, coal are going to be great initiation tools, and then they can duplicate in order to close this out. Well, Kevster's going to be duplicating up now. Samara is going to be meeting them. The Atlanta Rain trying to keep this fight going just a little bit longer. That self destruct connects onto Muse, but this should be done surely as the Gladiators have flipped over the point early enough. Look how split the Atlanta Rain are playing here. Just trying to hunt down all these little individual pieces across the map. Um, but yeah, they do end up winning that team fight uh, in quite a decisive fashion, actually, off the back of that sound barrier. Yeah, and the speed boost isn't the only tool that they use, right? They're able to get really deep because they have the coalescence to push with. So that wasn't a normal engage. You can only go for those kind of hyper-aggressive dives across the entirety of the map when you have ults to be able to utilize with it. There they go again with a little short-range dive, but Kevster gets picked by the Reaper of all things. 
Oh, wow, yeah, and that dead eye Birdering is gone. The DPS not existing, actually, on this mortal plane. Sapphire comes through. Muse, okay, that's the Primal Rage onto Massa. Wasn't able to just... Back. Yeah, wasn't able to actually pull anybody else into it. A coalescence from Shu as well. He's going to get stunned out of it here. Kai still wants to keep his team back in the action. But the good news for the Gladiators is they flipped over that point as that entire fight was actually taking place. So, the Atlanta Rain are slowly trying to win out this fight. I mean, they've got the damage for it, certainly. Uh, but luckily didn't lose too much. They've actually managed to gain themselves another team fight. Huge play by Muse to, Muse to be able to take out Massa, which also allowed Iris to die because he didn't have the Lucian appeal. But now Iris has ult. The backline of the Atlanta Rain, they're sitting pretty. Tank ults as well are going to be able to be used in this fight. What do the Gladiators have online? They're expecting a big performance from Kevster here, otherwise it's curtains in the first round. Gator is... Okay, he's laid down the supercharger. Birdering. Oh, he's eyeing it up. He needs to uh -oh. be so careful at the off angle here. Look at that immortality field. It is perfect. And yeah, Kai just layers in that dead eye. But a sand barrier on top of it. Yeah, no one is going to be able to contest that one. And uh, you're right, Josh. The Atlanta Rain had the perfect read, the perfect positioning, and all the ultimates they needed to try and close out that round. So they're going to be walking away with it one step closer to taking the map. It's a tough ask for the Gladiators to get value, or to get huge value, out of that composition on that round of Busan. It's just so open. Atlanta can see you coming a mile off. You have to use the speed boost really early on because there isn't enough cover to avoid poke damage. It's just hard for Muse yep. and for Kevster to be able to approach without getting killed. Now that we're on this stage, though, the Gladiators, they're going to be at much shorter range. The speed boost will cover a lot more distance, as will the Winston Leaps. And they're going to stick to this play. What are Atlanta up to? Are they running Moira here as well? Okay. okay they are. So Atlanta are looking like a, a really rush brawl version of their normal car. Ooh, okay, yeah, I mean, he's getting tons of seismic slam damage when he comes around here. And th these close corridors, I mean, it's good for the comp, but it's bad to play into this Doomfist. And if Pelican picks and chooses his battles well, could be on a win inside. Still, Massa goes down early, no more speed boost, and that's the DMEC as well. I don't think this is going to be winnable. Gladiators are the ones who are walking away with victory for now and getting a lot of these stagger kills. No pressure being applied to the point just yet, but they're just trying to make sure that I guess the Atlanta Rain can't continue to fight this one as so they, they continue to drag it out. Moffle eventually flipped this point over onto their side of things, but the way that team fight went as well, Josh, I mean, plenty of ultimates to use coming into the next one. Yeah, and space teammates, so nobody in a bad position whatsoever. They have let the Atlanta Rain in through the choke point, but here we go, the aggression, it's just crushing. Yeah, Coalescence actually traded from both sides, and Pelican is going to struggle to try and get a lot of work done. That's a great ultimate as Kevster actually ended up getting the duplicate off. And okay, Kai comes in with the Death Blossom. Now the Sound Barrier to try and keep them up. Meteor Strike doesn't quite connect, so it didn't bring down. Oh, wow, that was actually a really unfortunate timing to be losing that ultimate. He could have taken out that Supercharger, but it gives them just the extra bit of damage they need to close out this team fight. The Gladiators they don't have the bodies anymore. The health just got eviscerated. That is absolutely brutal. Really unfortunate stuff there from Kevster. It looked like a fantastic uh, fight for the Gladiators to take. First pick, they've locked the Atlanta Rain into a small choke point, but that supercharger damage is just obscene. And there's one of the advantages of running Gator on the Orisa regularly. He's also got fantastic halt usage and is a very intelligent player generally, but just straight up, the ult is amazing. Another halt to try and pull them in. At least so Pelican can get a bit of work done. This TP, they need to try and shut this down. Birdring forced to use that Ray form immediately. And look at the Coalescence. Again, it's way too much for them to withstand. The Atlanta Rain, they had the better positioning, but not the Ultimates to try and withstand that kind of pressure. The Gladiators, ah, oh, yeah, only a couple more people. I also think, Red, that this composition from Atlanta is just not that great. When we've seen Reaper Doomfist comps in the past, They've been comboed with the Sigma to give safer positions and shields. They've been comboed with Batiste to be able to keep people alive in the middle of fights so that you can buy time for cooldowns to come back. It's an odd look to go for the Moira without having the um, the more mobile comp. They do have a Coalescence available for this fight though. But the question becomes, are they gonna really try and like speed boost engage with the Coalescence here and just rely on Kai? It feels like Pelican has to get a pick. Okay, they've actually baited a bit of aggression from them. It forces out the sound barrier. 
Uh, now we see the duplicate here. Kepster just trying to basically destroy that supercharger, trying to get the damage in. Oh my goodness, though. Look at that. Kai comes in with a Death Blossom. It's going to be cleaving through a bit of the uh, the ultimates that were laid down. A supercharger and duplicate removed. And yeah, the Atlanta Rain. Nice and strong there. So baiting in the Gladiators into that fight, Josh, when you were talking about how exactly they were going to be trying to engage into that fight. Yeah, I mean, that was a fantastic one. Also, Pelican's able to get the kill on Moth really early on in the fight, which was a, a huge advantage for them to be able to work with. Look at the amount of ultimates that were used in that engagement, too. The Gladiators thought that was their winning ticket to be able to take the round. Here they go with the speed boost around the side, getting through very quickly on here. She's going to have his coalescence way before Iris does. And Pelican's yeah. ultimate is forced. There's a halt as well, but it doesn't get anything. <gasps> Yeah, Pelican tried to go aggressive with that Meteor Strike. It won't be happening. And look at that boop. Sets him up perfectly. Muse just bashing them into a corner. Gladiators, 83%. Will be flipping this up eventually. Is the Atlanta Rain. Yeah, I'm going to be losing it there. And uh, we are down to essentially our final team fight. The Atlanta Rain have to make some quick changes, some adjustments to their composition as Gator switches over to the Wrecking Ball just to try and contest this. This is looking rough. No ults available, though, for the Gladiators. Boots back. Not really any for Atlanta Rain, though, apart from the Coalescence. Does Gator get out? Oh. No, he doesn't. Punished immediately. And this is looking really rough. Unless Iris can stay alive and build up this Coalescence. He's got a hard job, though. The overtime is going. They've got to try and stall it out with the bodies that they've got. And look at that work that's being put into them. Hawk goes down. Iris just about builds up the Coalescence. Now he's going to be letting it loose. Kevster, though, moving over to the Doomfist. The Seismic Slam Hawk is out of here. Can there be any sort of clutch coming out from him? Moth dies with the sound barrier, but Shu comes back in now with one of his own. Surely this is unturnable. Kevster still putting in work, and there you go. The DPS duo is making sure that they are pushed off the point. Kevster and Birdering doing their jobs in the heat of the moment. So the Gladiators walking away with that round, bringing it truly to the distance. That's a close one. And the Gladiators commit to this composition, right? With the Moira, the Lucio, the Echo Reaper. We've seen it be run by a lot of different teams, but it is map dependent. 